Welcome to my course, Game Development Basics, Week 4, Lesson 1, Interfaces. In this lesson, we're going to explain interfaces and their common uses. We'll create an interaction interface that will allow our character to interact with things in the world. And then we'll explain the timeline node and demonstrate the implementation. Interfaces allow multiple classes to implement a common set of functions. And this is especially useful when classes are unrelated but have a similar implementation. A great example in the real world is a USB. Many devices use a USB interface, but they all have a different implementation. Similarly, in HDMI or any other connector commonly found in electronics, these are all interfaces. And these can be implemented in blueprints using a blueprint interface. And some examples of a common interface implementation would be anything that the player would need to interact with can have an interactable interface. And this is what we'll be using for our game. Another common use is that a weapon class can have a firing interface. And this would mean that the player would have one common interface with all weapons in the game, but each weapon could have its own functionality when you call the firing event. Let's start by creating our interaction interface for our game. The first thing we'll need to do is create our interface blueprint. In our blueprints folder, we can right click, then go to blueprints and select blueprint interface. And the naming convention for these is to start with BPI for blueprint interface underscore and then the name of your interface. I'll call mine interactable. And I just like to keep these in their own folder in the Blueprints folder. So I'll create a new folder called Interfaces. Let's open this up. And we can see here, this is the interface blueprint graph. And it looks a little bit different. And what we want over here is where it says functions. And it's created a new function for us. Let's call this Start Interaction. And with an interface, you could have multiple functions that you add. So in the example of the weapon, you could have a start firing function, and then you could also have a stop firing function. And these functions, like other functions, can have inputs and outputs as well. Let's compile. And then back here in my blueprint folder, we want an actor that we can interact with. So let's just create a new blueprint actor and I'm going to call this BP test actor. Let's drag one of these into our level right in front of our player and we'll open it up and let's create a visual representation for this actor. I'll add a cube. I'm going to put my cube so that it's right on the ground. And here we can see our cube in the world. In our test actor, if we go to class settings, we'll see an interfaces section and we can add our interactable interface to this actor. And we'll see when we did that, we now have over here in our interfaces section, a start interaction event. And if we right click, we can see implement event. And if we select this, it'll add an event to our blueprint graph for that function. And just for demonstration, let's create a second test actor. And for this one, I'm going to add a sphere. And we also want to implement the interface on this actor. So in test actor one, let's do a print string. and we'll have it print its own name. So we'll get a reference to self. And then if you drag that in, it'll create this get display name conversion for you. In test actor two, let's have it destroy itself when this start interaction event is called. And even though we're using the same event, both of these actors will have their own implementation. And let's do a quick test of this. In our player character, let's get the spacebar key 
And just for testing, let's do get actor of class and we'll do our test actor. And if we drag off of here and type start interaction, we'll see we get start interaction message. And you'll notice it has a little envelope. This means we're gonna be sending the message of this interaction interface to this actor, which means we would call whatever is tied to this event. And if we hover over it, we'll see that it says it does nothing if the target does not implement the required interface. There's also a does implement interface, which takes the input of the object and the interface and returns a Boolean. So this could also be very useful if you wanted to do a check before you tried to call the action. Let's duplicate this and change this to test actor two. Now in our game, if we press the space bar, we'll notice that test actor one printed its name to the screen and test actor two destroyed itself. And this is a great way to test the functionality, but this isn't really useful for our game. We want to use an interface that can call some functionality when the player is interacting with an actor in the scene. And the first thing we can do is set up a door. And so here's a challenge for you. We're gonna create a door for our houses. And what we want is to use an interface that when the player calls the start interaction, on the door, the door will open. So if you wanna attempt this challenge alone, you can pause the video now. Otherwise, I'll walk you through the steps. Here are the steps that we're gonna go through to set up this door. The first thing we wanna do is create a BP door actor that has a cube or something to symbolize a door, and then we'll fit it to the doorway of our house. Then we wanna create the BPI interactable interface. And we've already done this, so, so we can just use the one that we already have. It should contain one function called interact, or in our case, we called it start interaction. And there should be an open door event on BP door that is called when we call the interface action. And for now, we can continue to test this using the spacebar. But in the next lesson, we'll set up that the door will only open when the player is close enough to interact with it. If you wanna try this on your own, you can pause the video now, otherwise we can go through it together. And since we've already set up these test actors, what I'm gonna do is just delete them from our level, and then I'm gonna use test actor one for the door. So I'll just rename it to BP door. And I'll drag one of these in right into the doorway of my level. And we want the origin of this actor or where this widget is to be right where the hinge would be. So I'm gonna move it over so that it's almost in alignment with the edge of the door. Now BP door, I'm gonna undock and go to the viewport. And we can move our cube around and see how it looks in the world. And as we start to scale it, we can see in real time how it's gonna fit into our doorway. And that looks like a pretty good fit. Also, if you have dual monitors, you can move this to your second monitor and that gives you a little bit more space to work. I'm gonna redock this door and we'll start working on the functionality of it. But if you created a new actor, make sure you add the interface to it so we can still have access to this event. Let's create a new custom event called open door. And we're also gonna eventually want to create a closed door event so let's just do that now. And when we start the interaction, we wanna check if the door is open or close. So let's create a branch and we can drag this bool off and promote it to a variable and we can call it is door open. And if our door is open, we wanna close the door. And if our door is not open, we wanna open the door. So let's start with the open door function. 
when we open the door, we want the door to rotate so that it's opening. And then when we close it, we want it to rotate back. And we can rotate the entire door actor, or we can create a new component that will represent the hinge. On our default route, let's add, and we can use an arrow for this. And then let's take our cube for our door and put it on that arrow. Now when we rotate the arrow, we'll also rotate the cube or the door without rotating the entire actor. And let's pull our arrow in, and then we can do set relative rotation. And here we can use a make rotator. And when we rotate, we only wanna rotate it on the Z axis. So here we'll just type minus 90 and we'll make sure that our is door open is set to false because it is in fact closed. And here I am standing in front of my door and when I press the space key, the door will open. And it happened instantly, which isn't how we want our door to open. And for this, we can use a timeline. A timeline node allows us to play time-based animations. And it has several inputs that can be used depending on how we want to use this timeline. We can play it, play from start, stop, reverse, reverse from end, or set new time. And it has two output pins, the update, which will continue to execute throughout the length of the timeline, and then the finish, which calls once the timeline has finished. Then we can create our own custom outputs based upon floats, vectors, or many other things. You can even have an event that's triggered at a specific time on the timeline. Let's go back to our game and implement a timeline that will allow the door to open slowly rather than all at once. Let's give ourselves a little bit more space here. And then if we drag off here and type timeline, we can see add timeline. And let's create a name for this timeline and we can call it open door timeline. And for this, we always want the open door timeline to play from start. We'll move the execution pin down one to play from start. Let's open this up by double clicking on it. And here in the timeline, what we want to do is hit this track and we'll add a new track. And it's going to ask us what type of track do we want? And we can see here, we can have a float, a vector, an event, or a color. Let's add a float and we can call this Z rotation. Up here in the top, we'll see length and this is going to be the total length of the timeline. I think five seconds is a little too slow for a door to be opening. Let's try two. And now here in our track, we can add keyframes. So let's right click and add key. And we'll see that we now have this little blue diamond. And up here in the top, we can see the time and the value of that diamond. So let's set it to zero and zero. Let's add a second key. And we'll see this one has a different time based upon where we clicked. And we can set it to one and then let's just try point two for now. And we can continue to add multiple keys based upon what we want. And what we want is just for the door to open over time. So let's change the time to two, which would be in alignment with the end of our timeline length. And let's change the value to one. And we can use this to represent a percentage that the door will be opened over time zero being 0% 0 opened and one being 100% opened. We can also right click on these and select a different type of keyframe. For instance, we're using linear, but if we select auto, we can create a curve, which would mean it would start to open slowly, increase acceleration, and then towards the end, decrease acceleration again. I think this type of curve is more natural to how you would open a door in the real world. If we go back to our event graph, we can see now that we have an output pin of Z rotation. And we can take our Z yaw and type lerp and have a linear interpolation of our Z rotation. You can also lerp the rotator if you'd rather do it this way. 
and we have an input of A, which is our starting rotation, and B, which is our ending rotation, and then the alpha, which means the percentage that we're rotating between these two. And if we plug the Z rotation into our alpha, this will now interpolate between A and B over the course of this timeline. So now we just need to know what our starting point is. And we know our end point is going to be 0, 0, minus 90. This was the value we previously had there. And we can leave this as 0, 0, 0. But what this means is that if we interact with our door while it's in the middle of its timeline, it's going to snap back to 0, 0, 0 and then start over. It would be better if we created a reference of wherever the rotation was when we started this lerp. So here, at the beginning of our open door, we can get our arrow again, and then say, get relative rotation, and then set this as a variable. Then we can get this and plug it into our alpha. Now, regardless of where it is, it'll get a reference to this, and then lerp between that rotation point and our final rotation point. And this will be our open door function. We can actually just copy all of this and plug it into our closed door and set the ending point to whatever our door was closed, which was 0, 0, 0. And the last thing we want to do is set the value of this Boolean based upon whether our door was open or closed. And we can actually just do this right at the beginning of each of these events. So when we call open door, we can set is door open to true. And when we call close door, we can set is door open to false. So now if we press the space key, the door will open. And if we press it again, it will close. And if we press it in the middle of the move, it should reverse its rotation and go back to the way it was. But we do get a little bit of a buggy behavior if we continue to press the space key. We can fix this by creating another Boolean, and we'll call this door moving. Let's take our is door open Boolean and move those onto the finished. And then we'll put this door moving at the beginning. And when we start the function, we can set is door moving to true, and then set it to false on the finish. Let's do this for the open as well. And then here on our interaction, let's just create another branch. And so if door moving is true, we don't want it to do anything. And only if it's false, then we can interact. Now, if we press space key while it's in movement, it won't do anything, which will allow it to complete its movement before trying to go back to the way it was. So our door is working now, but what we want to do next is set up a way that we can only interact with the door when we're close enough to it. As it is right now, I can interact with this from any location in our level. And we'll set up this functionality in the next lesson.